Happy to be here. So we have got a tremendous amount of material to cover, so we are going to move relatively quickly, and uh, we're going to uh, try to answer some questions at the end. But if you do have questions during the course of the presentation, uh, please feel free to go ahead and ask them, uh, type your questions in, and hit the Send button, and we'll try to get to them uh, as much as possible. So our agenda, we're going to cover a quick history of Exchange as it relates to RIM and eDiscovery. We're going to talk a bit about the Exchange deployment options, the traditional versus full Exchange footprint. Uh, then we're going to get into the meat and potatoes of Exchange 2010, uh, particularly the RIM and eDiscovery features. We'll touch on some of the strengths and weaknesses of the platform as we see it. Uh, we're going to also touch just a little bit on the latest version of Exchange, which is 2013. Uh, which is uh, going to be coming down the pike sometime next year, and uh, some of the different things that uh, you all might consider in your deployment of Exchange uh, 2010. So with that, uh, what we want to do is cover some basic terminology so we are all on the same page. So uh, when we talk about Exchange, what we're talking about is the server-based element of the Microsoft email environment. So You've got on the back end, which is generally managed by system administrators or mail administrators, you've got the Exchange server. And that's kind of the heart and soul of the Exchange environment. That's uh, where your mailboxes are. That's where the configuration settings are set. Uh, that's uh, where the mailbox actually resides, um, at least the, the primary mailbox. So the Exchange server when we talk about Exchange, what we're talking about uh, is the Exchange server. Journaling is functionality which has two meanings. There's journaling and Outlook, which keeps track of the amount of time you spend on a particular task. What we're talking about in this context is journaling in the sense that every email that comes in and out of an organization's email environment is actually a copy is made of that email and sent somewhere, either to a journaling mailbox or to a third-party archive. So it's, what we're talking about here generally is going to be not the Outlook journal. Link is Microsoft's platform for instant messaging, video conferencing, and collaboration. And uh, it's one of the primary uses of Link is as an, as an a enterprise instant messaging and video conferencing platform. Uh, so it's a separate product from Exchange, separate license, and so forth. Some companies will have it. Some companies won't. Um, Outlook is the client side or client element of the Exchange email environment. So for most companies that have deployed Exchange, on the front end, users are going to access email and the other Exchange functions through an Outlook client. Or the next item on here, OWA, stands for Outlook, used to stand for Outlook Web Access. Now it's referred to as Outlook Web App. That is the internet, the pure browser-based interface into the Microsoft Exchange environment. Office 365 is actually a combination of different Microsoft hosted services. So when we talk about Exchange, or we talk about Link, or we talk about SharePoint, uh, Microsoft Office 365 is actually getting access to Exchange or Link or SharePoint, but subscribing to it as a software as a service or as a hosted application. So Office 365 is Microsoft's uh, subscription-based access to Exchange, Link, and SharePoint. Now, most of the folks on this call are very familiar with PST files, and PST files are the local store. They're the mail stores that are not located on the Exchange server, but rather are typically stored on a local user's hard drive, perhaps on a file server. They can be copied and, and basically replicated across an IT infrastructure. So when we talk about PST files, we're talking about the local mail store. And as you'll see, there's also a new nuance or new use of PST files in the Microsoft ecosystem. And SharePoint, of course, is a separate platform from Exchange that allows for organizations to build their public web presence. It allows for collaboration. Uh, it's a very robust and rich platform, which is a separate entity unto itself. 
you could probably do five webinars just on SharePoint and discovery and records and information management, but we don't have time for that today. But just want to get that terminology out there for you all. What I'd like to do now is just run quickly through a mini history, if you will, of Microsoft Exchange uh, with, from the perspective of what RIM and eDiscovery professionals would want to know. Microsoft Mail was actually the first commercial platform that Microsoft put into the market, and that was delivered in 1988. The first version of Exchange that was available in the market was in 1996, Exchange version 4.0. Uh, back when e-discovery and the thought of email being part of a, a litigation and discovery was was not uh, not particularly uh, well known, Exchange 5.0 and 5.5 came out a year later, and interestingly enough, the first iteration of being able to journal email uh, was available way back in 1997. Uh, Microsoft also introduced the uh, the Outlook web access or the ability to get your email through uh, the internet at that, uh, at that stage. Exchange Server 2000 introduced the concept of the dumpster. And the dumpster is really the concept that when an end user deletes an item, the items are still retained on the server. So it was a rel relatively rudimentary dumpster as compared to what we have today, which Mart is going to cover later. But um, it was introduced back in 2000. Uh, Exchange 2003 had a significant, a couple of significant introductions to the Exchange environment. One was something called Cached Exchange Mode, which introduced this concept of having two mailboxes, one on the Exchange server, and then another mailbox which is locally cached or stored locally, which is in what's called an OFT or offline store. And there's a synchronization process that was introduced so that essentially that when the network went down or a person got on an airplane, they would have, still have full access to their mailbox even though they weren't connected to the Exchange server. Uh, ActiveSync is Microsoft's platform for integrating and synchronizing mail and the Exchange database with PDAs, smartphones, iPhones, etc. So the first version of that was introduced to, with Exchange 2003. Exchange 2007 is the first version of Exchange that got into the RIM and eDiscovery universe, more so with RIM. Um, managed folders were introduced at that point in time. The journaling function, which had been introduced way back in, in 1997, was now, with Exchange 2007, was more robust in that you could select individuals instead of having to journal an entire database. The other sig significant thing is that unified messaging, the ability to have voicemail messages come into your mailbox, was introduced as a default feature. You didn't have to ex spend ex extra money to get that. So now, in Exchange, you actually had the ability for voicemail. It, Exchange is actually a voicemail platform now. And so that made it much easier for companies to deploy this concept of a uh, unified messaging, which is delivering voicemail messages into a user's inbox. That, that, be, that functionality had been around, but you had to get use third-party uh, vendors like Cisco and others to, to do it. And then with Exchange 2010, uh, which was released actually three years ago, hard to believe, uh, Microsoft really jumped uh, full-fledged into the eDiscovery and RIM uh, functionality field with um, more extensive email management uh, in the way of tagging, which is what we're going to cover in more detail later, uh, an improved dumpster, uh, personal or archived mailboxes, which are part of the Exchange mail store, uh, auditing of mailboxes, and moderation, uh, meaning that uh, someone can uh, look at messages before they get delivered. And believe it or not, uh, even though from my experience a lot of companies haven't even gotten to the point or are just now deploying Exchange 2010, we're already looking at next year sometime Microsoft delivering Exchange 2013. Marta, anything you wanted to add or, or touch sure. on that I yeah, just, uh, highlight? Yeah, just for people who are you know, looking at this from eDiscovery from a RIM point of view, 
it's very important to know which version of Exchange you have. Each version of Exchange has a slightly different format, slightly different uh, tools that it has with it, especially with the older versions. And believe it or not, I have seen people still on Exchange 5.5. You need to know how you're going to be able to access those. You're also going to need to know which features were implemented for each of those releases if you're still dealing with the older servers. And we're going to focus very much today on Exchange 2010, but we will mention some of the features that were, for example, journaling introduced earlier things that you're really going to need to be cognizant of when you're doing your day-to-day -day type of work. Super. Thanks, Marta. So moving along, we talked a bit uh, in the introduction about what we're going to cover in terms of uh, deployment options. And I think it's absolutely critical for our audience to understand that in the new world uh, of Microsoft email, there are multiple options in terms of how you deploy Exchange and where the data can be physically located. So the traditional way that Exchange was deployed is a company would go out, license Exchange, license Outlook or Microsoft Office. They would install the Exchange software on internal servers. They would back up to internal backup tape. And they would run that, pro that entire ecosystem internally. Uh, going back four, five, six years now, Microsoft, uh, companies have sprung up that allow organizations to go to them, such as Rackspace, and say, okay, host my environment. So there's questions about where the data is being, uh, where the data is located, how it's being managed that are implicit in that, in that um, particular model. Microsoft itself is, is a major player in this space with the Office 365 platform that I alluded to earlier, where an organization can go to Microsoft and subscribe to Exchange. And there are different um, options that are available uh, within the Office 365 uh, environment. And th this next slide illustrates that in the Microsoft 365 ecosystem, an organization can subscribe to, to Microsoft Office 365. And there's a couple different ways to do it. One is what they call their standard option, where if your company subscribes to the standard option, your infrastructure is being hosted in a virtualization environment where there may be one physical server and there's 10 different companies, yours included, whose infrastructure is being hosted on that one physical server. Now there's all kinds of firewalls and, and database protections and things to make sure that the one client's data or one customer's data isn't intermingled with another. But there's questions about how much control you have over that environment that are implicit in the standard version versus dedicated. And you can see here on the right side of the screen, the dedicated means that Microsoft will provision your own infrastructure, your own architecture for your company. But there's a, a higher cost. It's more expensive to do that. But you also have more granular control over the environment. And this slide shows in the Microsoft, uh, in the Office 365 realm, what, the different, what some of the different options are. There's what they call a kiosk option, which might be for manufacturing employees in the company uh, who don't need uh, as much functionality in their email environment. They might access uh, their email through shared computers. So you can see in this column, there's, there's less, less functionality. And then there's an exchange plan one, exchange plan two, which would be the standard versus the the more um, dedicated environment. But the point I want to make here is if you look at what's highlighted here in the red box at the bottom, um, which plan you get is going to determine whether you have certain types of functionality, such as what we're going to talk about today, legal hold. Not all the hosted solutions have uh, the ability for you to implement the legal hold through the Exchange uh, hosted environment. Marta, anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I point out that the standard on-premise exchange as well mirrors very similarly the different plans that you have here, except they're not called plans, they're called CALS, Client Access Licenses. There's standard, which you, you purchase for your standard servers. There's also enterprise, which is priced differently per mailbox. And it very much mirrors the plan one and plan two here to get the more advanced functionality even on-premise you are going to have to pay a little bit more for those enterprise cows for the mailboxes that are covered under that functionality. Super, thanks. All right. So let's talk a bit about Microsoft Exchange and Outlook in terms of the traditional functions. So when uh, most of us think of Exchange and Outlook, we're thinking of, OK, I can send email. So I can communicate with 
with uh, colleagues internally and externally, so I can send and receive email. Uh, I can keep track of contacts. Um, I can set up appointments. I can invite people to appointments. I can um, schedule appointments and see who's available and who isn't. So uh, those are core functions that uh, people use on a day-to-day, minute-to-minute, hour-and-hour basis in Exchange. And then certainly tasks and uh, notes are, are probably a little bit less used. And then the idea of journaling, not the journaling we were talking about before on the Exchange server where we're making a copy of every message, but the concept in Outlook where you can keep track of how much time you're spending on a particular task. Um, these are all things that are part of the traditional Outlook uh, and Exchange environment that people are familiar with and use on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, in the new Exchange environment, and particularly with 2010, Exchange 2010 and Outlook 2007 and Outlook 2010, really Microsoft is moving towards this unified communications paradigm where instant messaging, text messaging, and voicemails are all being consolidated in one single uh, access point, which is the Outlook inbox or the Outlook web app or the Outlook internet-based uh, interface. And here you can see this is a, a showing a instant message, a text message, and a voicemail all sitting inside a user's uh, inbox in, in Outlook uh, web access. So that concept is really compelling. So the idea of what, what Exchange can do and what an Exchange and Outlook environment can do has expanded tremendously. And I think it's important to point out that a lot of times the IT folks are very excited about these functions. The business people may be excited about it too. But if legal IT and records and the business aren't all talking about the implications of these issues, um, I've seen companies that have deployed unified messaging where legal is, is the la are the last ones to find out about it and they start to, to throw their hands up and saying, oh my gosh, we don't want all these voicemail messages sitting inside users' inbox. We already don't, we are already struggling with discovery of email. Now we're adding a whole other set of content. So uh, this unified communications concept is, is compelling and it has huge business benefits, but there's also legal implications uh, that people need to be aware of. Um, just one other point on the unified communications. One of the sub-elements of unified communications is, is, as I alluded to earlier, is unified messaging. And that's the idea that your voicemail messages get delivered to your inbox and in the Exchange 2010 environment, they're delivered as MP3 files. Well, Exchange also has a, a very interesting function called voicemail preview and or text preview of voicemail. And what that does is it takes that voicemail message and there's some limitations to it that you think it's 90 seconds, any voicemail message uh, for 90 seconds or less. It, what it does is it converts that voicemail to text and it delivers that text into your inbox. Now one of the dynamics of that is that it only, it's only about, I think, 70 to 90 percent accurate is what, what Microsoft talks about in the literature. So now you're creating this whole, potentially this whole new set of content that you know up front is, is being this machine translation that's not going to be 100 percent accurate. So there's some interesting and, and important considerations there from a legal discovery perspective that I think the legal and RIM folks really want to be talking to IT about to make sure that you know, if there's a compelling business need for that kind of functionality that they at least understand what the implications are. Marty, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, just don't forget if you're using unified communications, you really want to make sure your retention policy addresses the communications as either um, Usually, let me just put it this way, usually people will have different retention policy for voicemail for uh, the transcripts than they will for their standard email. And it's really important that that's communicated throughout the team. Absolutely. So thanks, Marta. And the link integration, again, is just link is a separate platform from Exchange. It can be deployed in an, by itself. There doesn't have to be integration between link and Outlook and Exchange. But for a lot of companies that I've worked with, they actually do have that integration available. So what that means is that from within Outlook, uh, here's an Outlook interface. You can actually reply to an email message with an instant message. Um, you can, from within the link interface, you can actually reply to an instant message with an email. And one of the, one of the key elements of this whole uh, process and workflow is that there is potentially 
what they call a convert there is a conversation history function that can be enabled within link that means in what the conversation history does is it essentially tracks all your instant messages and because link I haven't really touched on this yet but just also to make you aware link is a very powerful and robust platform and one of the components of that plat of the link platform is the ability to deploy telecommunications or telephony so link can actually replace an organization's PBX I'm not going to get into the merits of whether that that it, it should or shouldn't but the point is that in some organizations they link is used as a telecommunications device so this conversation history this middle screen here and well here let me go so on the left you see the highlight here with the red box conversation history in the users exchange mailbox there's created if this if this is enabled a conversation history every time the person makes a phone call or receives a phone call if this is enabled a record of that phone call sort of like so what it is is it doesn't actually record the call itself so you don't have a recording of the call but it says Jim called John or John called Jim and there's a record of when that call was made and the length of that call also conversation histories are retained so if I have a 10 or 15 line instant message conversation with someone that actually the text of that conversation is captured uh, within this conversation history. Uh, this is a screenshot that shows where that can be enabled uh, in, the, uh, in, the link, in the link client. And uh, there are some ways for organizations to use group policies and other enterprise type controls to either enable or disable this type of functionality. So I think that's a uh, point of conversation that should definitely take place between legal IT uh, records and the business. And some other things too, if you are enabling this kind of um, you know, link communications, instant messaging, what have you, you're really going to have to uh, implement some sort of policy around how people can use those communications. And I particularly bring that up because IM is, tends to be a very shall we say, fluid type of communication, and you could have a lot of information going back and forth, especially if you're connected to outside people. Uh, if you have people uh, working for your organization that are, you know, IMing to call, uh, colleagues outside of your organization, they're, out, they're emailing, IMing friends, etc. what needs to happen is that you need to have a policy about that um, and it kind of structure of enforcement, because especially in the United States, you, where you're, 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 you don't have an expectation of privacy uh, with work communication, um, you need to be able to, to uh, enforce that uh, within your organization. So that's definitely a conversation that needs to take place uh, as part of your records management. Yep, absolutely. And uh, so moving along with, in terms of the full footprint, so we've, we've talked a bit about the link integration and instant messaging and, and phone call conversations uh, or record of phone call conversations. There's also this concept of integration between Outlook and Exchange uh, and SharePoint. And the, although with reference to SharePoint, it's more of an Outlook-oriented integration. But essentially, with SharePoint, as I, as I alluded to earlier, SharePoint is a very popular, very robust collaboration platform. It can do a lot of different things for an organization. But one of the primary things uh, that it's used for is to set up these team sites or project rooms where multiple people from across an organization that are collaborating on, let's say, building a new product or launching a new service can contribute documents, spreadsheets, PowerPoints, Word documents. They can set up a shared calendar. Uh, they can share contacts. They can share uh, uh, all these different um, collaboration artifacts and all these different uh, items in a SharePoint site. And believe it or not, you can bring a lot of those things down and synchronize them into your Outlook client. And that synchronization, if it's enabled and turned on, actually, those items are being stored, and you guessed it, a PST file, a separate PST file from the one that's storing the email that you might have created in your Outlook client. But, and nevertheless, it is a PST file. So there can be a significant amount of data that's now being synchronized and put into a PST file it has nothing to do with the regular ebb and flow of email uh, in, in an environment. So I think that's a very interesting question. 
here's what it looks like. This is an Outlook client, and the first box here on the left shows the SharePoint lists that have been synchronized down. Uh, this particular one is for uh, fictitious project, Team Alpha project docs, and you can see these five or six documents are sitting somewhere on the back end, or rather are sitting somewhere on the user's hard drive in a PST file, but I can double click on this document, work on it. Uh, there's some, uh, there's synchronization questions. You know, if I work on a document and then I forget to synchronize back up to the uh, SharePoint server, maybe I'll have two different versions of that document sitting around for a while. So there's some implications from a discovery and records perspective. Uh, with this integration with SharePoint. Uh, Mart, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, but um, uh, if not, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you so we can dig into the, the interesting and myriad uh, uh, questions and, and uh, uh, points that you're going to be making about the, uh, about the Exchange 2010 platform. Sure. Yeah. Well, the only thing I'd say about that SharePoint, it is interesting on one hand that Microsoft is emphasizing, or rather de-emphasizing PSTs. On the other hand, they just enabled a really, really, really robust uh, creation of PSTs. But in any case, um, let's talk about records information management, specifically in Exchange 2010. Uh, what they, Microsoft has done is they've really taken seriously the uh, concerns that they've had from a lot of their users that they're trying to make a one-stop shop for all their information. Previous, prior to Exchange uh, 2007, certainly, you had a lot of people use different tools to manage different functionality in their organizations. They'd have third-party archiving, for example. They would have um, records management in a completely different um, set of uh, area. They would have, um, you know, basically different tools for different functionality. What Microsoft has been trying to do with the past few releases of Exchange 2010, or excuse me, Exchange itself, is coordinate not just Exchange but SharePoint, Link, etc. Is bringing all that functionality into a Microsoft um, realm. So what they've done is they've improved Exchange 2010 to help facilitate that. And in order to facilitate that, they've done a number of improvements in areas such as retention policy. They have created a whole new archiving structure in Exchange 2010. They've created an entirely new litigation hold structure, and they've vastly enhanced their searching capabilities within the tool. In addition to that, to support these improvements, they've completely re-architected the way the dumpster works. And the dumpster, to reiterate what John said earlier, is like a recycle bin in Exchange. Basically, when things are deleted out of Exchange mailboxes, they're not really deleted. They're actually put into this dumpster area, this recovered, recovered deleted item um, that may or may not be accessible to the users. And this area has been repurposed not just for that the uh, recovery, but also for litigation hold. It's now being used. New folders have been added to it specifically for that functionality. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in just a moment. And the other thing that they've done uh, to make the, the information management easier in Exchange is they've added role-based access control. Now, this is not a new concept. This has been around in all kinds of products for all kinds of reasons. But basically, it is having a predefined set of functions for specific roles and then allowing specific users to be assigned those roles. So in other words, you don't have to, for each user that needs to do this, you don't have to give them permissions to everything. It was a real problem with earlier versions of Exchange is that, for example, if you were a security manager or discovery manager, you, they did not want to give you the ability to create mailboxes or to delete mailboxes or to change um, you know, policy of, of backup tapes. Now, with this role-based access control, they don't have to. These roles are built in. And they're also customizable. You can add custom functionality to a lot of these things. So when you look at these combined, it really has improved the records information management. Let's take a look at some of these in a little more detail, uh, starting with the uh, retention policy. So retention policy was available in other versions of Exchange. For example, managed folders, which are still supported, um, were actually what this actually does is that different folders are created by administrators with different retention policies on them. They're pushed out to the mailboxes, and you have default policy put on the default folders, inbox, send items, etc. And what would happen is users would classify their messages by putting them in these default folders created by the administrator. Um, and then the policy would be um, 
enabled on those particular folders. Now, the challenge with that is that users themselves, if you're using uh, Outlook very heavily, you tend to do your own filing. You tend to do a lot of organization of data using your folders. And when you have managed folders and you're forced to use specific folders, it's a lot more complicated. There's also um, the other challenge, which sometimes you might have things that are very similar but might need different retention tags for different reasons. You didn't have that granularity with managed folders. So again, it's still supported, but what Microsoft has done is introduced what they call messaging records management, which again is written in another, you know, in another form. And they're using different types of tags to control the retention. Okay? So to make a very simple case of this, there's a set, a set of tags that is put by the administrators on mailboxes themselves. This is the default policy for retention. Okay? Then you have specific folders that have different, uh, for example, inbox sent items, deleted items, can have their own policy tags. Okay? And you can have any number of these policy tags attached to a policy. And then you have personal tags. The administrator will create a number of these personal tags, and they're used by individual users to manually tag different items in their data set. Okay? Now, obviously this kind of retention does require end user training because what ends up happening is these personal tags can override all the other tags. Now, the administrators do have some control over this. They can only set up specific tags. You know, the, the users can't you know, go outside of what the administrators have set up. But it does add a little level of complexity. So training is required uh, for that. But this new me messaging records management, MRM, uh, is Microsoft's sort of go-to uh, methodology that they'd like to see implemented. Um, and they're trying to de-emphasize the managed folders. So again, retention policy's gotten a little more complicated, but a lot more flexible. Now, once you apply a retention policy, what can you do with it? Well, first of all, age is the only criteria that you can use for retention, which it is the largest criteria, it's what most people will retain based on. Um, and you can implement many different tags with different ages. So you do have that flexibility there. And then you can, with the retention policies, you can move items, you can delete items, um, you can delete them permanently, or you can delete them so they're recoverable, again, using that dumpster. Um, you can put things in the archive ma mailbox. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And you can also move them to custom folders, but you're not able to move them to all types of folders. The other option is you can mark items past the retention period so that people will notice, oh, wait a minute, this is past my retention period. Maybe I have to manually do something with it. So again, there's pretty robust actions that are supported. In addition to that, you do have special policies that you can enable if you have unified communications enabled. If you have voicemail, you can actually set up separate retention policies specifically for voicemail. Now going forward, another item, a major, major item in the records management is archiving. Now Exchange 2010 has introduced the personal archive, but as um, John mentioned earlier, journaling has been around for quite a while. And journaling, while not an archive in and of itself, has facilitated many, many third-party archiving products. And basically what journaling does, as mentioned before, it saves a copy of all email going to and from selected mailboxes. So you don't have to do this for your entire enterprise. You may only want to journal for selected people. It really aids with compliance, e-discovery, et cetera. However, it's sort of, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a resource-intensive way of doing it, and there's not much granularity with journaling. So to kind of help out with archiving and, to be honest, to get people to use Microsoft as their one-stop shop, they have added personal archives, also called online archives, to the um, tool belt of things that Exchange 2010 is going to do. Um, and basically, the online archive is the peer of a mailbox. Every user has one. I should say every user who has an enterprise cal that, is, um, that has this functionality enabled will have one on the same level as their uh, mailbox. It's completely transparent to the user. They can drag and drop. They can search these, these uh, personal archives. They're not going to notice uh, a difference. Um, from the point of view, however, for management, it's a big difference. You're not using number one third-party archives. You're not using PST files. They're trying to replace PST files, ironically, because some of the other functionalities encourage in PSTs, but they are trying to replace PST files as archives because they are a management nightmare. I'm sure everyone in the audience has their nightmares getting PSTs, finding them, having them stored all over the place. In fact, many people have an implemented group policy against the creation of PSTs, but they still have archiving needs, things that you don't want in your main mailbox, 
lots of things that you want to store for contract purposes, for you know, further detail, who knows, but you want to have this archive. Okay. So this new personal folder associated with the, with the mailbox, associated with the user, and starting with Service Pack 2, you can put that folder anywhere. So some of those hybrid hosting models that he was discussing, for example, a person may want to have their main mailbox hook, hosted on premise, and then have a outside cloud-based provider for their archive. Things like that can, can be done as well. Okay? Now the archiving uh, kind of leads the question to litigation hold. Litigation hold is another huge feature that's been added to Exchange 2010. And it basically allows the um, proper authorities, the people who have the, um, the access, the, the records management role or the discovery management role, to enable these litigation holds on individuals or enterprise or group level. Um, and what happens is this hold is done via the dumpster. So the users, the end users, people who are creating and deleting email, don't notice the difference. You can delete email uh, at your heart's content. It doesn't matter because what happens is in the dumpster, that email is retained. Not just that email, but any versions of that email are retained in the dumpster. Okay, so there's special folders now for litigation hold, and unless that person takes off the litigation hold or unless it's uh, applied, you know, specific policies, um, you're going to have that that those items kept. Now, the really nice thing about the litigation hold is the litigation hold uh, runs across not just the user's mailbox but also the archives. In addition to that, when you are searching items using the multi-mailbox search, you're able to search the litigation hold repositories in, in the dumpster as well. And the users can't modify, they can't delete, and it makes a very, very powerful tool for, for doing litigation hold. Now, does it have all the reporting you might like? Not quite, but they're getting there. Okay, now just a quick note, it does require the enterprise Cal Standard licensing will not allow you to have the litigation hold functionality. Now going forward, let's talk about the e-discovery features in Exchange 2010. The biggest e-discovery feature from my point of view is they have put a user interface around the multi-mailbox search. Now you could search in previous versions of Exchange. The problem was you were using PowerShell or really, really crude interfaces. They actually have a nice interface which makes it very easy to set up the keywords, very easy and transparent to the person doing the searching. Once again, the multi-mailbox search and also the discovery mailbox, which we'll talk about in a moment, are only available to people who have been assigned that role within the role-based access control system. Okay? So using this interface, you run a search. That search, those results from that search, reports from that search, are put into the discovery mailbox. Okay? Um, and once again, the permissions are through the discovery management role. You can see this is an example of how you would add people to it. So let's talk about those discovery features. You're searching against all the stores. As I mentioned before, the personal archives, the mailbox, litigation hold repositories, and also uh, IRM protected messages. Um, if you have an enterprise cal for this, you can get decrypted messages and search them decrypted rather than uh, have them as exceptions. Um, the e-discovery features themselves are accessible via the standard cal. So everybody who has a mailbox, you're able to search those mailboxes, assuming you add them to the search. Um, attachments can be searched as well, and this is an actual notable point because earlier versions of Exchange did not search attachments. Now, having said that, this is very important for e-discovery and also for records management people to actually verify that they're able to search all the attachment types. And the reason I mention this is the way the e-discovery search works is it is an index search. To create that index, uh, tools called iFilters are used. iFilters basically parse the text out of various file types. Now, by default, all Microsoft Office iFilters are installed. However, by default, PDFs are not installed. PDFs are not on the, the default list of iFilters. So you want to make sure when you're looking and talking and discussing with your uh, enterprise admins, your exchange admins, have they installed the PDF I filter. Perhaps you use other tools, tools that are specific to your organization, like Hadron. Um, I'm not sure if there's an I filter for those, but if it is, and if a lot of people are emailing them back and forth, you better have the I filters installed, or else they will not be included with your search. Now, the nice thing about this version of Exchange and the multi mailbox search is it will tell you when something cannot be indexed. So you will have a report of items from those mailboxes that were not able to be searched. And that's really important because previous versions kind of ignore that. Sometimes it's just as important to know what you could not search as well as what you could search. So just verify that one way or the other. You will have a list of items that you could not search, but it's always a good idea to be proactive and know what is available in there. 
Now, once your searches are done, the results are copied to the Discovery Mailbox. This is a separate mailbox, once again, only accessible to people who have the role, the Discovery Management role. Um, and from that mailbox, you can deduplicate. There's deduplication options. There's also reports that you can uh, have in there. There's some basic tagging, there's basic audit logging, et cetera, also in the Discovery Mailbox. Now, getting the data out of the Discovery Mailbox, that's a different story. Um, however, a lot of really good functionality has been enabled for this, um, for this uh, tool, for the Discovery feature. Now, based on that, let's talk a little bit about the strengths of Exchange 2010. Now, we talked about sort of how it's been a progression from very, very basic uh, Exchange to Exchange 2010. And Exchange 2013, by the way, looks like it's going to be continuing along that road. Um, the interfaces from both the multi-mailbox search and also the administration uh, consoles are really quite good. They take away the, uh, the control from PowerShell, which has been traditionally what people use. But PowerShell is still around, and it's which is good because Exchange administrators actually prefer using scripting to, uh, to, to GUIs often. You have large mailbox support, which has been missing for, for quite some time. Um, you have integrated archives. I think that's a huge plus, and for many organizations, especially smaller ones, who don't want to maintain third-party tools, et cetera, for archiving, that's really, really helpful. You have a lot more flexibility in your retention policies than previously, and you have robust functionality, including eDiscovery, which is included in the basic licensing. Um, and what's really good, the Office 365 offerings are really quite good. Um, especially if you're not an organization that's particularly concerned about litigation or if you're not an organization that's particularly concerned um, about some of the clients, if you're not in a highly regulated industry, for example, it's a really good option, especially for smaller businesses, although it does scale for the large enterprise businesses, and a number of them have moved to Office 365 or similar offerings. So those are the strengths of, of Exchange 2010. Let's address a little bit some of the weaknesses of Exchange 2010. Um, now, what we're talking about here is weaknesses in terms of records management, in terms of e-discovery. We're not talking about what the administrators uh, actually running Exchange service, things like that. There's a lot of functionality, certainly performance improvements that we could talk entire, uh, entire sessions on, specifically why admins want to upgrade. So if you are upgrading to Exchange 2010, or if you already have Exchange 2010, you may have done so for performance reasons, but you might want to add RIMS as Exchange um, or excuse me, e-discovery people, you might want to take a look at the weaknesses. Um, first of all, and from a discovery point of view specifically, the functionality that's included in Exchange 2010 is only available for Exchange 2010. This means if you have a mixed environment, if you have Exchange 2003 servers, 2007 servers, if you're dealing with SharePoint, if you're dealing with PST files, etc., the functionality you have here works great for Exchange 2010, but it does not address any of those things. You're still probably going to need other tools, other record management tools, other discovery tools to address everything outside of Exchange 2010. And that's a pretty uh, key point. Not necessarily the weakness of Exchange itself, just uh, sort of the fact of life. The second thing uh, is retention. Marta? Go, please go. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Mara, I just want to interject. I've, I'm working with a few companies now that are looking at deploying Exchange 2010, and, and Marta's point about the mixed environment probably is somewhat lost on, on folks that don't have an IT background, but that is an absolutely critical question from an IT perspective because when IT is looking at deploying a, uh, a new version of Exchange, they've got to look at how do they keep the environment going with no downtime, how do they migrate to the new system, and how do they maintain that environment and the new environment. So. There are, some of the companies I'm working with, there are some questions about how they've been doing legal holds and how they've been executing legal holds against uh, exchange currently. There are some fairly significant questions that need to be thought through and planning that needs to be take place, not only from an IT perspective in terms of, you know, are we moving from 2003, which is a 32-bit, to 64-bit or 16-bit, you know, there's all those IT, but there are some significant questions that may need to be asked and, and really thought through from a from a records and discovery perspective. So I just wanted to, to chime in and just emphasize the point that you're making that that is absolutely a critical one, um, that that migration path um, is there's both technical and information governance questions in both those things. 
Mm -hmm. And it's always, always important that you understand what your IT department is doing when, you, when they are upgrading, uh, which is something we'll come to in some considerations you want to take care of. Um, just some other things in Exchange 2010 that are considered weaknesses, if you will. There are some complaints about the retention, even though it's much more powerful than it has been. Um, the fact that it is age-only criteria, sometimes people like to use size criteria, keyword criteria, those types of things for retention addresses, that sort of thing. Um, the fact that you can't move to all different folders, the fact that you can't create new folders, things like that, also a little bit of a weakness in retention. Um, and the policing of the users themselves, that training that you have to do, the making sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, um, and also the fact you can't override what they're doing, uh, that is a definitely a, a different mind shift, especially for the administrators, and it's not very popular in some quarters. For discovery requests, as I mentioned before, you must investigate the IFA to I filter limitation. There is not a PDF uh, iFilter by default, and that is an incredibly crucial limitation because PDF has become um, really a default standard for a lot of organizations. The other question is how is the index deployed? Again, the searches you're doing for the, the, um, the e-discovery searching in Exchange is off of the index. So you need to know how that's deployed. Is it a full text index? Can you search for noise words? Can you use punctuation numbers, et cetera? Some indexes support, some index setups support it, some do not. Okay. Along that same, uh, the same line, indexing searches um, kind of limits your criteria. Um, it doesn't support this, uh, things like predictive coding, things, a lot of the modern technology, if you will, are not in Exchange 2010. And a lot of people don't expect them to be in Exchange 2010, but it's a good thing to know. You have more or less shallow criteria, even things like, um, you know, uh, fuzzy searching even, is not actually available in uh, Exchange 2010 by default. Um, last but not least, very simple thing, getting items out of the discovery mailbox, you might have to use a PowerShell script, you might have to drag and drop. It's just a little limitation, it's the most annoying thing I know of uh, from, from that perspective. Last but not least, Enterprise Cal is needed for litigation hold, it's needed for a lot of advanced features um, that may or may not be applicable to your organization, smaller organizations might not want to have that, but keep that in mind, you want to know, are you purchasing those Enterprise Cal's, and if you are, who are you going to distribute them to? Um, and again, some features are only accessible via PowerShell, which for those like me who prefer GUI interfaces, I hate PowerShell. Anyway, um, along those lines, let's take a look at some of the considerations. Um, let's talk first about the future hold. What does the future hold for Exchange? Uh, and there is a new service pack coming out for Exchange 2010. It's going to be service pack 3 sometime next year. Um, and that mostly has been released to integrate with Exchange 2013. So you can have mixed environments. Exchange 2013, no release date yet. We're, we're assuming that it's a big assumption. Sometime Q1 next year, maybe Q2. Um, there are some really, really nice things about Exchange 2013 based on uh, a lot of Microsoft, uh, what they've released. Uh, specifically unified searching. You are going to be able to search across 2013 platforms. Exchange SharePoint Link, if you're all in 2013 for all of those, your searches can be done on all, all of those. There's going to be a case management, discovery case management features in SharePoint that you can actually manage your discovery cases in SharePoint itself and do what's called in-place searching. Remember Discovery Mailbox, you're copying everything to the Discovery Mailbox. Well, they have a new back-end index there. It's supposed to be absolutely magnificent, quick as anything, that they're able to actually, as you type, you're going to be able to get your results back. In addition to that, you're going to be able to query your set of results, so you're going to be able to further filter inside those results that's using the query. And if you do a lot of discovery searching, you realize how powerful that is. In addition to that, there are exports, thank goodness, there's going to be EDRM uh, load files, and you're going to be exporting to native format as well, obviously things that I have personally been clamoring for. Litigation hold is going to be in place hold. They actually have rejigged uh, the way they're doing litigation hold. And even better, you're going to be able to do litigation hold not just by mailbox, you can be able to do it by keywords. You can be able to say, you know, these people, anything related to these keywords, put them on litigation hold and, and store them. You're also going to be able to enable multiple holds on uh, the same person. It also is going to support large mailboxes up to 100 gigabytes. So these are all things that Microsoft is touting. We haven't yet seen it. Um, I do believe they have some beta versions out there, or um, which I, I know we're installing some up here, um, but I'm really looking forward to seeing the other features uh, in Exchange 2013. Again, they're really working towards getting everything in one platform so you don't have to go outside the Microsoft ecosystem. So let's talk a little bit about considerations. Um, whether you've deployed Exchange or whether you're thinking of deploying Exchange, uh, you need to know from record information, e-discovery point of view, what versions are you using now? What are the limitations of those versions? How do you access those versions? What kind of uh, features do you have uh, in 
implemented and what features should you have implemented um, because there's a lot of features in there you might not be using. Uh, are the, if you are using Exchange 2010, do you have the correct permissions? Do the right people have the right permissions? All these kinds of things um, you want to make, make sure you're focused on to make sure it is valid for your compliance needs. Uh, another question, where is your data located? If you're hosted, there are a slew of questions that you need to put together. You know, what agreements are in place, uh, what kind of liability, what kind of backup, what kind of data commingling, as uh, John referred to earlier, you know, is that a problem for your organization? Incredibly secure organizations just can't have that. Make sure you know that. Another thing I would point out is if you are a hosted solution, where is your data hosted? Um, there's a lot of different privacy rules in the EU versus here. So if you're from the EU, you probably want your data hosted there as well. Um, are your users properly trained? Uh, are you, uh, do you have information rights management set up? All these questions you really should make sure you know the answers to if you're in a highly litigious environment or if you're heavily using Exchange. Now some other considerations just in general. It's very important that people on the non-technical side have a good relationship with the technical side of their departments, the IT people. There really should be, if you don't already have one, and most organizations, especially larger organizations, have them, but you should have contact in the IT department. In fact, you should have a weekly or monthly meeting with people from business, people from legal, people from IT, to facilitate that kind of communication. Make sure you have, as part of this, retention plans, discovery plans, backup plans, and when things change, Make sure these get updated because a lot of times you'll put them in, you know, two, three years ago. They may never have changed even though your systems and your um, equipment may have changed. And personnel who audit the process, who make sure they're correct. I can't tell you how many times people say, yeah, we have a discovery plan, but no one's ever run it through. So when a real discovery happens, they're in panic mode. What is your mobile device policy? Do you have policies for personal email? Do you have a third-party archiving vendor? How does that fit into all of this? And last but not least, do you have encrypted data? And if you, if you do, how do you handle that? Not just now, but data from five years ago or data from five years from now. So these are all considerations that you can have um, when you're looking at Exchange in particular and also just IP in general. Okay. Um, now, we do have some resources here for you as well. These resources, if you are getting started with Exchange or you have some questions or you want to get some more granular detail, how to do different things like a mailbox search or applying a retention policy. NSExchange.org is an excellent place to start. They have tutorials and they have articles there um, which are very, very helpful uh, for learning these details. Microsoft TechNet itself is very good about all the basic details uh, for technical information, but also for um, they have sections for people who are in a discovery or a legal role. You also have some links here to Sherpa Software. We do some of the third-party tools we mentioned, and also the Ingersoll firm, which does consulting on various things. Um, now, if anybody has any questions, please do enter it in the questions portion of the, um, of the uh, call here. Uh, someone has asked, what is the role of journaling? Our uh, IS department journals everything, which seems to negate any records retention rules being applied to the folders. Yes, that's exactly what happens when you journal. When, what happens when you journal? I shouldn't say that. What normally happens is you journal for a purpose. So the question is, why are they journaling? Are they journaling for compliance reasons? Are they journaling for, um, for archiving reasons? And if they are, what you have to do is, when does that data leave the journal? Where is that data going? And is your retention policy following it through the data chain? Okay, that's the key about journaling, is that you need to, it is another avenue of data. So you need to have a policy and a process for that journal data, just as you do for standard mailboxes. Okay, so you basically are creating a secondary set of data stores. You still need retention policy on your main mailboxes for obvious reasons, because people are going to keep data forever if you don't, and you need to worry about you know, litigation and et cetera. But you've created a new data stream, and you have to have policy for that as well. And chances are it is being deleted out of the journal, and chances are it's going someplace else. And the question is, what are people doing with it? Why hasn't it been enabled? And if it, is, if it has been enabled for archiving purposes, which is a very popular reason for it, then you have to chase that data down to the archive and make sure the retention policies, number one, are the same, or at least um, that they're complementary between your archive and your live exchange stores. It's all part of your retention policy. It's just another step in that. Believe me when I say they're not journaling just for the sake of journaling, but simply because that takes way too much room and way too much effort as well. Okay. So any other questions that we have? 
Yeah, no, another one that came in, Marta, here, um, this one came in offline, but it's uh, the question that the uh, participant has is uh, do the functions, do the e-discovery and records functions work if one's still on Office or Outlook 2003? Um, and I know that there's, there's some definitive uh, issues in terms of you need to be on a certain version of Outlook right, in order for if some you, of the metrics yeah, applications if, and that type of mm -hmm. stuff to work. If you want to use the native Exchange 2010 functionality, the e-discovery functionality, et cetera, is built into Exchange. So it really doesn't matter what client you're using because you're looking at the back end. Having said that, unless I'm highly mistaken, I don't think you can use Outlook 2003 to connect to an Exchange 2010 server. So if you are using Outlook 2003, chances are you're not connecting to an Exchange 2010 server. And keep in mind there's a big difference between Outlook, which is a client-based tool, and you can create PSTs with it, which is, is its own problem, versus Exchange, whereas Outlook really can't affect Exchange that much. You're not going to be using Outlook as your discovery tool. Now, having said that, if you are referring to Exchange 2003, they're really rudimentary discovery features. And in fact, I don't even think they're called discovery. In fact, I know they're not called discovery. They're searching features in, in Exchange 2003, very rudimentary. You can do basic searching. I don't even think you can search attachments, so, uh, to be quite honest with Exchange 2003. So if you're on Exchange 2003, you're probably going to need some other tool to do your searching in Exchange 2003. Once again, Exchange 2010 is only looking at and only searching things stored within Exchange 2010. And I, and I believe that, if I'm not mistaken, I know that there, when Microsoft talked about the, the whole move from managed folders to the retention tags, I believe that there are some, you need to be on Outlook 2000 10 for the retention tags to be able to use that functionality. Um, if I'm not mistaken, they were going to supposedly put some, put, do something so that they would make that compat backward compatible with 2007. But I don't yeah, think... Yeah, I think that there are some plugins for 2007, but I don't know how, mon how much functionality. It really was built for 2010. They were built in conjunction with one another. We do have another question here that are there any unique features that will not be deployed? to 365 uh, dedicated? That's an excellent question. Do you know, John? Pardon me? Do you know, are there any unique features that will not be deployed in 365 dedicated hosted? There are, well, first of all, off the top of my head, I don't know the specifics, but I, I can tell you this, that there is, there are some resources that Microsoft has available that lay out all the different features and functions that compare on-premises versus the hosted. And maybe what we'll do, what we'll do is we'll include a link to that resource um, in the follow-up email that's going to go out to people. But just in conceptually, there are differences between the, um, there are some functional differences that 365 does not have that are available in the on-site version. There are some limitations. I don't know if they're what they are exactly off the top of my head, but we'll make sure to point to the reference that Microsoft has published, um, which talks about that. There's a about a 40 or 50 page white paper uh, that has a, a table that lists the different features and functions. Um, but there are some, there are a few limitations in the 365 as compared to on-premise. Yeah. So another question that we had come in was: Is the online art archive utility a separate solution from journaling? The answer to that is yes, it is. And then as a, as a follow-up to that, where does this mail get stored? Okay, as part of the user's mailbox on Exchange, the answer to that is no. So journaling is completely separate. Journaling is, is you know, like I said, you take a data stream when it's in transit and you're just uh, filtering a copy of it to the journal. Okay, so then you have your main mail message and that's what's stored in either the mailbox or, of course, the archive. The archive is completely separate from the journal. It's also completely separate from the mailbox. It is another data store, which is a peer of the mailbox. And it gets stored wherever the administrator says to store it. Okay? It can be stored on the same database in the same group as the mailbox, but that's kind of beside the point. Why would you want to do that? Usually archives, especially if you're archiving for storage reasons, you want to put it someplace else. So you can store it, you can dedicate or excuse me, designate that archive, that uh, archive be stored, online archive, personal archive, whatever you want to call it, be stored in another server, in another mailbox group, in another database, in another, ah, I 
I'm not sure if you can do it in another domain. I, I'm pretty sure you can because you can actually store them in a hosted solution and have your, your, um, your main mailbox be on premise. So you have a lot of flexibility where that's stored. And the question is, if you're the IT person or if you're addressing the IT person, where are they stored? Do we have to worry about those, those groups? So they're associated with the mailbox, but they do not need to be stored in the same place. Hey, Marta, I just I pulled out that white paper that I, I have. And just, just one point that I think could be potentially significant is that the Office 365, when you talk about public folders, which we really haven't mm -hmm. talked about today, but the on-premises version still has the public folder capability. They're not, they were going to deprecate that, but it's still fully supported in Exchange 2010. Apparently, the online version, as of this white paper, which is September 2011, does not support public folders. And I know for some of the organizations I work with, uh, that could be an important issue. So just mm -hmm. as an FYI, but like I said, we'll, we'll include this resource in the follow-up email that goes out. Yeah. And interestingly enough, they are bringing back public folders in uh, 2013. So interesting. Um, someone asked us, uh, where can we obtain a copy of today's slides? There is going to be a follow-up email to this webinar. We're going to send it to all the participants. And that is going to have links to the slides and also links to the recording. And did, did you want to answer that one? Did, I don't think, did we answer though? There's a, another question about is the online ar archive, while well, I was looking, I don't know if you answered this. Yeah, the we online did answer archive that facility, You answered mm -hmm. that one? Yep, I did, yeah. Okay, great. So is there, yes, go ahead. Oh, nope, I think what well, we're at the, the 2 o'clock mark, so as, as, uh, unless there's any other questions, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up here. And I just want to thank Marta um, very much uh, for her insight into the exchange uh, universe um, for myself and I want to thank everyone uh, I just I can't emphasize enough that the IT that the IT legal and records folks and business people all need to be at the table that's critical uh, the, the legal and records folks really need to understand how the exchange environment has got to where it's at today so that you can plan now on how you're going to utilize and leverage the features in, in exchange 2010 and I think it's important to say whether or not you're going to need to look at third-party tools to augment or bring in the functionality that you need from an e-discovery and records perspective. So uh, with that, I'll thank you. Marta, did you have any last comments? Or Thank you. No, thank you very much. This was a very interesting webinar, and uh, hopefully everyone was found what we presented useful for them. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.